Before we get started, I'd like to say that uh, this is one of the most successful, wonderful festivals I think I've been to in several, many years, I guess. And uh, as for speeches and stuff, Boy Sets Fire, yeah, what they said, they're awesome. But I'd like to read to you a book, while, while they're setting up, I'd like to read to you a couple pages from a book called Amazing Grace by Jonathan Kozel. I have a fear that man, man's biggest, well, I guess best quality, I guess in some ways, is that we can adapt to anything. And what fears, what I, what scares me the most is where has seen so much pain, seen so much suffering, and there's so much ugliness in the world that we have adapted ourselves not to care anymore, to go on with our daily lives ignoring what's out there, what's happening out there. And I want to thank you guys that are paying attention to the bands right now and not at the shopping mall, which is really cool that everybody's doing and selling things because it's much better than buying it from a big store. But I really appreciate everybody that's paying attention to the bands because that's kind of why we came here, to share with you guys what we have to say. But again, this is uh, Amazing Grace by Jonathan Kozel. He also wrote a book called Savage Inequalities, which is a very powerful book. On another afternoon a few days later, I talked with a group of adolescents who gathered in another storefront office that is being used as a youth center. This one was not in the South Bronx, but in the Harlem neighborhood, about a dozen blocks west of St. Anne's. When I share with him the statement Jeremiah made about the feeling that he is locked down, a 15-year-old student, Isabel, jumps right up and says, I think that's too strong. I would put that differently. I ask, how would you put it? It's not like being in a jail, she said. It's more like being hidden. It's as if you had been put in a garage where, if they don't have room for something but aren't sure what to do with it, and don't want to throw it out, they just put it there and they don't think of it again. I ask her if she believes Americans do not have room for her or people like her. Think of it this way, says the 16-year-old named Mar Maria, who's Isabel's half-sister. If people in New York woke up one day and learned that we were gone, that we had sim simply died or left for somewhere, how would they feel? How do you think they feel, I asked. I think they'd be relieved. I think it would lift a burden from their minds. I think the owners of the downtown stores would be ecstatic. They'd know they'd never have to see us coming in the doors. And the taxi drivers would be happy because they would never need to come here anymore. People in Manhattan go on and lead their lives and not feel worried about being robbed and not feel guilty and not need to pay for the welfare of babies. Do you think that's how they really look at people in this neighborhood? I think they look at us as obstacles to moving forward, she said. The students go out of their way to make it clear that they do not subscribe to the rhetoric about conspiracies or genocide. Perhaps because I was white, perhaps because they didn't know rhetoric that was frequently discredited, perhaps they just truly really don't believe it. It's not like that. Well, these babies just aren't dying fast enough, Maria says. Let's figure out a way to kill some more. It's not like that at all. It's like, I, I don't know how to say it. She holds a styrofoam cup in her hands and, it and turns it slowly for a moment. If you weave enough bad things into the fibers of a person's life, sickness and filth, old mattresses and other junk thrown in the streets, and other ugly ruined things, and ruined people, a prison here, a sewage there, drug dealers here, the homeless people there, then, then give us the very worst schools anyone could think of, hospitals that keep you waiting for 10 hours, police that don't show up when someone's dying, Take the train that's underneath the street in the good neighborhoods and put it up where it shuts out the sun. You, gotta believe me. you can guess that life will not be very nice and children will not have much of a sense of being glad of who they are. Sometimes it feels like we've been buried six feet under these perceptions. This is what I feel they've accomplished. Put them over there in the big housing project, says a boy named Benjamin. Pack them tight. Don't think about them. Keep your hands clean. Maybe they will kill each other off. I have a few statements to make about that, Isabel says. When we talk about the people who are making these decisions, we keep saying they. And most of the time we think of they as being white. We don't even know who they might really be. They just keep saying this because we know we have no power to decide things. 
Something's always happening where the last and final vote was not the one we made. So we say they did this, and they seem extremely powerful, but we don't know who they are. Sometimes it seems like they're the welfare workers or the supervisors who can be very rude to people. Or maybe the nurses at the hospitals, or the doctors, or the police. But most of these people do not have much power. So you always want to know who does have power. And you ask this question, but you can't find out. You see destruction around you, but you don't know who the destroyer is. Some people, I point out, would say that the destroyers are people right here in their neighborhood. I name the most frequent. Drug dealers, the kids with parents who do not give proper supervision, teenagers who cause havoc in housing projects, absent fathers, women who refuse kinds of jobs, they may find a meaning. The drug dealers don't have any power over the economy, Maria says. They don't control the hospitals, they don't run the schools, they don't run New York. Okay, I have a few points to make. This is an extremely shy, dark-skinned girl who tells me she's from Honduras. She speaks softly at first, the others turn her, and even a group of somewhat restless boys who have been whispering to one another quiet down and pay attention. My mother can't speak English, so I go with her to welfare. I feel like crying when I see the way she's treated. Fill out this application, hurry up, sit down, it's not your turn. This is not the way people should be treated. It's not the, even the way you talk to dogs, because you don't bark at dogs. I hear this lady say to another lady, to a social worker or a supervisor, why are they here if they don't speak the language? Why don't they go back where they're from? But it's not only the fucking language, because no one talks that way to a rich lady who does not speak English. Go downtown, you'll see what I mean. Sometimes these women come from Italy or Argentina or from Spain. They go into the stores in their beautiful clothes. They're treated like celebrities. It isn't the language, it's the skin color, it's being poor. This is something more than disrespect. It's as if they wish you did not exist so they would not have to be bothered. If you go downtown to a nice store, says Maria, they look at you sometimes if your body is disgusting. You can be dressed in your best dress, but you feel you're not welcome. They follow you sometimes, but they do not want to touch you. You pay for something. She pulls back her hand like that, like my hand is dirty. White people who feel sad by Maria's words may nonetheless tend to discount the accuracy of her perceptions. It may even hear them a hint of paranoia. Yet countless statements in the press would certainly reinforce her paranoia. If that's what really image is. Images of moral dirtiness and overflowing worthlessness identified with poor black Hispanic women and children fill the pages of our daily paper. And even the young people who don't read the paper are exposed to the same images and conversations heard all day on New York City and on mainstream radios. They are not like you. They are not like me, says a popular talk show host. Broadcast the evening, late hours, New York top radio AM station. They are something apart. They are distinct. Who wonders if there's a factory where they drop those kids? What, 10 a minute? At first, it seemed to be speaking only at the black teens who have committed these serious crimes. This language has swept that beyond that goes beyond the law and order issue. No amount of food stamps, no amount of punishment, he says, will help the situation. There is nothing to do to segregate yourself from them. They are a different species. Black and Hispanic adolescents speak a lot of being disrespected, dissed by other kids in their communities. But the sense of disrespect these youngsters hear over the radio and see sometimes in the tabloid papers in a different language is in a different league entirely from the sort of thing they may experience from their own peers. The statements of Maria and her sister, one after another, leave no doubt that they have understood the message being given to them by a large and appears expanding sector of American society.
you very much for coming out. Thank you for listening. Those are people, those are adolescents, not much younger than yourselves. This song's called Man Vs. Paper. years from me now. The same faces are here. The same feelings are here. And it's you guys that keep everybody alive. Completely.
It's okay though now, because we're not empty. You feel it pushing the wall. It's like you, nobody hears anything you're fucking saying. But we're not empty. Our cups are full. And all together, we've only begun to overflow into the mainstream. To poison their pure, clean waters, their fake world. We are here, all of us, to take back the humanity that is ours. This world that is fucking ours. This next song is new. Um, we don't have any merchandise for sale. We prefer other people and other distros to make money off our product, so I'm not going to tell you to look for a guy with big ears and a red goatee or something. But if you can probably find stuff, you want to get it through another distro in person. Or did Boys Set Fire just fucking rule? Were they like awesome? Or what? They're amazing. They're, they were so awesome. One, one thing to take note, there's some, a young person got up here and was telling about how much he cared about the band. And uh, he talked about it. He said, I think he said, if, if you need a band to follow, this is the band. I think that Boys Set Fire would agree they're here to share their ideas with you. They're not looking for iconism, like, that's kind of what's fucked up the whole scene is the fact that people give the bands way too many power, the label's too much power, you've forgotten that you guys buy the records, you guys are there for us, for, we're here for each other, so don't ever let a band overstep their boundaries, control that, please. You guys are the police in that sense. Remember that in 1997, the cloning began, so in 1997, human beings went from being priceless to being worthless. We're all expendable. We probably started in the 60s, we just found out in the 90s. That's a trick. That's a trick. We probably started 500 years ago. Ready? I'm ready. One, two, three, four!
next song is really important to us because it uh, talks about not inflicting the same misery as misery has been inflicted on you by your oppressors. The song's not about fighting violence with violence. The song's not about retaliating because your feelings have been hurt. This song is about a bigger movement, a movement of understanding. This song's called Goliath. wonderful when everybody goes off and feels energy but please be considered if somebody's falling down or watch your fist or whatever because we're not here to hurt each other yeah do those if you do those dive they do those bug things don't kick people in the face with your feet you know Please visit the Huru Table. This song goes out to, uh, to major, every, everybody, I guess. This song is about, it's called Ipecac. Ipecac is a substance used to make yourself vomit. It goes out to anybody that's ever not felt pretty, felt ugly, and did things to their body that were unnatural. But...
next time you think somebody, uh, next time you want to make fun of somebody or make yourself feel better than they are, uh, putting somebody down, <laughs> please refrain from comments on what people look like. It's hard enough for us to live up to what we feel is attractive from television, from the billboards, from the media. You reach a point in your life where you, where you can't feel any uglier. And that's the part where people become hopelessness. And that's where people start doing bad things to themselves. River blindness. Song's called River Blindness. inside of every one of us. It's that river that makes us feel things. It's that river that teaches us to love, teaches us to be compassionate for others. And what's happening is the system overhead is trying to 
dam that river. That's what that song was about. This it was, uh, well, you sowed the seed for me, and will you teach me to believe? And that song is about all of you people, and how we teach each other to believe, and we're not that strong, when we feel that we start to give in to what the rest of the world wants us to, what we believe is cool on television. We have each other here, and that's why it's very important to maintain this community, because there are several times where I know that I would have fallen if it wasn't for the people that I played with, or played for, or the people that have been involved in my life through this scene. So no matter what, the most important thing initially is that we maintain this community. This song's a cover. That was great, man.
you. I would like, before we go, I would like to thank everybody very much for coming out. I'd like to thank everybody that for supported by the grace of God. I wasn't sure if we were a serious band or if we were a side project or a joke band. At this time, we're feeling so good and so happy that the scene is the way. I don't know. But we're going to try our best to be a little bit more consistent. And then I just feel that we've kind of sometimes have half, half shirked it because of the responsibilities we have. And we think that you guys deserve a lot more and we really enjoy playing with you guys. So thank you for being patient. And I think at this time, we're going to be a full-time band. So thank you very, very much.